Let's all uh, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. If you brought your Bible with you, we are in the book of Ephesians. If you're just joining us this morning for the first time or for the first time in a little while, we've been going through the book of Ephesians and taking a look at this book, which is so packed with rich insights for who we are as Christians, who we are as the Church of Jesus Christ, and how we are called to live. And this morning, we're going to talk about prayer. Now, my guess is that prayer is one of those subjects that every time we think about prayer, um, if you're like me, you might feel a little bit guilty or a little bit sheepish when the subject of prayer comes up, because I think most of us as Christians, when we think about prayer, feel like we probably don't pray as often as we should, or as much as we would like to. And so we struggle to pray. And even when we do pray, sometimes we struggle to know how to pray. We don't know always what should we pray for. Um, We find ourselves often getting in a rut where we pray for the same things over and over again. and, And so we feel very redundant in our prayer lives, maybe a little bit embarrassed about our prayer lives. Most of us would like to grow in our prayer lives. But we are not sure how. Maybe you've been in a position at some point or another where you've wondered, uh, maybe I'm just not cut out for prayer. Maybe prayer is for those super spiritual people, those prayer warrior type people, but I'm not one of them. And so you've wondered that. But we forget that prayer is something that can be learned and it can be taught. And here's my evidence for that. You remember the occasion where the disciples of Jesus came to him, and this is in Luke chapter 11, and they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Now, if you think about that with me for a minute, um, if you are someone who feels like you need help with prayer or you're in need of instruction when it comes to prayer, you're in good company because that's exactly who the disciples were. They knew their lack of, of knowledge when it came to how to pray, and they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray which assumes not only that they knew that they weren't necessarily as good at it as they would like to be, but that Jesus could provide instruction. So prayer is something we can grow in, and one of the ways we can grow in prayer is by looking at the prayers of Scripture. Some of you joined us last spring when we did a Bible study on Wednesday nights where we looked at the prayers of the Apostle Paul, and we looked at a variety of different prayers that Paul prayed throughout his letters, and we saw that there's some very rich insights about how we can pray just by looking at the prayers of Paul. And today we come to one of the prayers of Paul. This last part of Ephesians chapter 1 is one of Paul's prayers, and there are some very, very rich insights here about prayer in general that we can glean for our own prayer lives as we look at this. And so I want you to read with me as I read Ephesians chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 15 through 23. Hear now the word of the Lord. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places." Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are much like the disciples. And we know, if we are honest with ourselves, our need for instruction, not only in prayer, Lord, but in all of the the things of God. Lord, we are in need of your help and your teaching. And so we pray that you would use your word to transform us this morning so that our lives would not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but would be transformed by the renewing of our minds and that we would be able to test and, and know your perfect will. Lord, we pray that you would make that happen this morning. 
as we reflect upon your word and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to highlight from Paul's prayer at the end of Ephesians 1 three major foundational truths that I think we can see in this prayer from the Apostle Paul. And the first one is that I believe Paul's prayer was founded on God's sovereignty. Look with me again at verses 15 and 16, if you would. He says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, the first three words that he uses there, for this reason, should cause us to ask, well, for what reason? For this reason, I give thanks and I pray for you. Well, for what reason? reason. Does that refer to the words that come after it, or does that refer to the words that come before it, or the section that came before it? It might first appear like he's referring to the things that came after. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I I do not cease to give thanks for you and remember you in my prayers. And he might be saying that, but what's interesting is that often when Paul uses a phrase like that, he's not referring to what comes after it. He's referring to something he just said. It's often referring to, in light of what I just said and what I just talked about, therefore, I want to tell you something else. And you can see how that phrase would be used like that. If I were to say to you, I ate way too many cookies and desserts over Christmas, and I stopped exercising entirely, and for this reason... I really need to uh, get back on track and uh, start exercising again or something like that. You would see that, that, that what I said after was referring to what came before. It was for that reason that, that I needed to do something. Well, uh, if you look at Paul's letters, often this phrase refers uh, to what came before. And I think that's part of what's going on here. When he says, for this reason, he wants to draw our attention to what has he just been talking about back earlier in chapter 1. And the theme of the entire opening paragraph of the first chapter, if I were to summarize it in one phrase, I would say it's the sovereignty of God in all things. He's talked about, and we've already looked at this over the last three weeks, that it was God who sovereignly chose us before the foundation of the world. He goes on to say it was God who by his sovereign grace redeemed us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he talks about the sovereign power of the Holy Spirit in in guaranteeing the inheritance of the saints until we acquire possession of it. And then the most powerful statement about the sovereignty of God is in verse 11. Listen to verse 11 again with me. He says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, I just want you to let that sink in for a minute. That is one of the most stunning statements about God's sovereignty in all of the Bible. It says that he works not just some things, but all things according to the counsel of his will. His will. That is a comprehensive, emphatic statement about the sovereignty of God. Now, some people sometimes ask the question, and this is a good question Is everything that happens in the world today God's will? When we turn on the TV and see everything that happens, or we see everything that happens in our lives, is all of that God's will? And I would respond by saying, well, it depends upon what you mean by God's will, because when Scripture talks about God's will, it uses that. Uh, in at least two different ways it talks about God's will. Sometimes when the Bible talks about God's will, it talks about his will of desire. And his will of desire is his revealed will. It is his commands. It is his laws. It is his precepts. It is the, his will for our lives, the way he designed us to live and that he is revealed in his word. And if we're talking about God's will in that sense, his will of desire, then Of course, not everything that happens in the world is according to God's will because people disobey his will all the time. They rebel against him and and break his laws and transgress and, and all of these things. And so when it comes to his will of desire, no, of course, not everything that happens in the world is God's will. But the Bible also talks about God's will in a second sense, and that is not his will of desire, but what we might call his will of decree, And his will of decree refers to everything that God has decreed or ordained in all of history. 
That is the sense that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 1 when he says God works all things according to the counsel of his will. He's talking not about God's will of desire there, but his will of decree. Nothing happens in this world that is outside God's will of decree. From the greatest events in human history to the smallest events of our daily lives, there is nothing that happens that is outside of his will of decree. He is sovereign over everything that comes to pass. And he works everything, past, present, and future, according to his will. God's will of decree can never be violated. It can never be thwarted. And this is stated over and over again throughout the scriptures. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 say, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. Once again, That is God's will of decree, and his counsel shall stand. He will accomplish his purpose. So how does this relate to prayer? Well, what I want you to notice is that this entire opening section of Ephesians emphasizes the sovereign character of God, and I believe it is for this reason, in part, that Paul is praying for the Ephesians. Paul's prayer was founded on God's Sovereignty, and, and this is important because sometimes people will ask the question, they'll say, well, if God is sovereign over everything that comes to pass, then why pray about anything? If God is, is truly sovereign over all things and, uh, and he knows all things, well, then does prayer really make any difference? Is prayer just totally meaningless? And I would respond to that by saying, no, of course not, because God doesn't just ordain the ends. He also ordains the means by which he accomplishes all things. And one of the primary means that God uses to accomplish his will is our prayers. So far from being meaningless, prayer is extremely meaningful in light of God's sovereignty. I love what uh, theologian Michael Horton said when he said, you know, some people ask me, why pray if God is sovereign? And he says, I respond by saying, why pray if he isn't? Think about that for a minute. If God is not sovereign, then why bother praying if God does not have the ability to accomplish anything that comes to pass and and is in control of all things? I think we know just instinctively when we pray to God that he's sovereign because if he wasn't, then why would we have faith that he would be able to accomplish whatever it is that we're praying for? So the sovereignty of God, far from being a a a, a discouragement to prayer is actually a great encouragement to prayer and I think you see that in Paul's letters so very clearly that his prayers were founded on the sovereignty of God now I want to highlight a second thing and that's that Paul's prayer was focused on the Ephesians knowledge it was focused on their knowledge if I were to ask you what do you tend to spend most of your time praying about Probably many of us would say, um, if we're honest, and I'll put myself in the same boat, we tend to focus primarily on daily, earthly, material concerns. Asking God for help with X, Y, or Z. So we pray a lot about our health. We pray a lot about our safety. We pray about provision in our lives, material provision, or maybe success for something that we're working on. Sometimes we pray for silly things. Uh, Anybody ever pray for a parking spot? Nobody's raising their hands. I know you have. I know somebody in this room, probably everybody in this room has prayed for something like that. Now, those material earthly concerns are not bad. In fact, God cares about those concerns and those needs in our lives. I think one of the primary pieces of evidence for that is in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus talks about praying for our daily bread, which is just one of those concerns. But what's so interesting is, if you look at the prayers of the Apostle Paul throughout his letters, he rarely ever prays for any of those kinds of things. You look at his, his, his letters, and it just those kinds of concerns just seem missing. He's not primarily focused on those things. What's interesting here is that when he prays for the Ephesians, he prays for deeper spiritual knowledge. That's the primary theme of this prayer, is deeper spiritual knowledge. And he prays that they would know at least three things. Let me give them to you. First of all, he prays that they would know God better. He prays that they would know God better. Verse 17, he prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul's praying here that they would have a a spirit of wisdom, more spiritual wisdom in their lives from the Holy Spirit, that that God would uh, reveal something to them. That's where the word revelation comes, that they would have something revealed to them. And what is it? It is deeper knowledge of God himself. That's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, when's the last time you spent a good deal of time just praying to to know God better? This should be central to our prayer lives. You think about the fact that Scripture says we were created to know God, and therefore one of the primary aims of our lives should be to know God better. Jesus says in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And Paul says, I'm praying that you would know God better because, you see, the more that you know God, the more you will love God, and the more that you love God, the more that you will desire to know God. Knowing God brings more joy, more contentment, more peace than anything else that this world can offer. That's why the prophet Jeremiah says, In chapter 9, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. You see, knowledge of God is more valuable than the world's wisdom, than the world's power, than the world's riches. And this is why this was at the center of Paul's prayers when he was praying for the Ephesians. It should be at the center of our prayers as well. So he prays that they would know God better. A second thing he prays for is that they would know greater hope. That they would know greater hope. In verse 18 he prays, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And so once again, we see this theme of knowledge, don't we? Last week, we talked about the inheritance that believers have in Christ, and that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, you have an eternal inheritance, and it is eternal life in an eternal kingdom with an eternal king. And this is the hope to which we are called. And Paul wanted them to know that hope better and better and better, to know greater hope. And the question we might ask is, why? Why is that so important? Well, I can think of at least a couple of reasons. One reason is that knowing our hope helps us to endure hardships. Because I don't have to tell you this, I'm sure pretty much everybody in this room already knows that this life is full of hardships, and you will endure many hardships over the course of your life. And if this world is all that there is, those hardships can become impossible to bear. But the saints throughout history have endured hardship in part because they know that what we are experiencing now, to quote again from the Apostle Paul, is but a light and momentary affliction that is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And that is the strength that hope provides in the midst of hardships. We need hope as we go through this life, and it's what allows us to persevere even when our circumstances do not change, and oftentimes they don't change. I like these words from Pastor Richard Koken, who writes, it is vital to understand that so often in our Christian lives, God doesn't want to alter the circumstances of our lives, but to alter the way we see those circumstances by changing our hearts. The Lord wants to use the circumstances of our lives to sanctify us and make us more like Jesus. And so hope allows us to persevere when those circumstances are difficult. But another thing hope does is that hope prepares us for eternity. Some of you were with us a couple of years ago when we did a series that uh, featured some teaching from Paul Tripp, and we talked about the importance of thinking about eternity and thinking about what eternity uh, is all about. And one of the things that he said that I won't probably ever forget in that series is that he said Christians are called to live our lives with a preparation mentality, 
rather than a destination mentality. And what he meant by that is we are called not to see this world as our destination, but this world is preparation for eternity. And here's what he wrote. He said this. He said, one of the good things the Bible keeps in front of us is that this is not all there is. The world and everything in it is marching toward eternity. And when we understand that, everything changes. You understand that this life is but a brief preparation for the forever that is to come and that the messiness and hardship of the here and now are not an interruption in the plan, but a part of the plan. The one who is in charge has chosen to keep you in a world that is less than perfect, not because he has forgotten you and what you need, but precisely because he loves you and is delivering to you exactly what you need. See, Paul knew that Christians need to know greater hope. We need to know the hope to which we have been called because it's that which transforms us in this life and that which gives us endurance and steadfastness in this life. So he prays not only that they would know God better, but that they would know greater hope. He also prays, thirdly, that they would know God's power. And in verse 19, he says that they would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Why does Paul pray that they would know God's power? Well, because a greater knowledge of God's power leads to greater faith in God's provision. Let me say that again. The more you got, know God's power, the more faith you will have in his provision. When we tend to doubt whether God will provide for our needs in this life, oftentimes underneath that, part of the problem is we're doubting his power. And yet, Scripture says that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And yet, do we believe that? You know, we, we are so quick to, I think, doubt God's power. Does he really have the ability to do what he says he can do? Or does he really have the ability to address whatever need I am facing in my life. And so we are like all of the sinful, frail human beings that have ever lived. I always think of Abraham and Sarah. God comes to Abraham and Sarah, and um, they're both in the ballpark of 100 years old when God reminds them that I'm going to provide a child for you. And uh, what do they do? Well, they do what any of you would have done if God made that announcement. They laughed <laughs> because they said, you know, <laughs> Uh, okay, well, um, we're a little past that stage of life, that season of life. I mean, um, that idea, if, if you heard it, just like they heard it, would feel so outlandish that it would be hysterical. Well, they doubt, and God's, that God's not going to do that. And do you remember what God says to them? He says, why did you laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And that's a rhetorical question, right? It's not really a question for you to sit a long time on and think a long time on. The answer, of course, is no, nothing's too hard for the Lord. But the question is, do we really believe that in our, in, the, in our heart of hearts? Do we truly believe that? If we do, it should increase our prayer life a hundredfold because a greater knowledge of God's power leads to greater faith in God's provision. So do you notice here what the focus of Paul's prayer is? It's primarily on simply knowledge. He prays that they would know God better, that they would know greater hope, and that they would know God's power. But that's not where he ends. He ends by talking about Christ's exaltation and enthronement. Paul's prayer, I believe, the reason that he talks about this is because his prayer was fueled by Christ's enthronement. At the end of this passage, he concludes by giving this grand description of Christ's enthronement. Look at verse 19 again, what he says. He says, According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I get the sense when I read these words that Paul 
was, was writing, and, and it's almost like he just got a little carried away. He starts talking about Christ at the end of this prayer, and he just can't help himself. And he's talking about his authority and his power and his seated in heaven and all of these wonderful things. And it's just like it's spilling out of Paul talking about the, the reign and the rule and the exaltation and the enthronement of Christ. He talks about the resurrection and the ascension of Christ in verse 20 and this description of Christ literally taking his seat on the throne of heaven. And then in verse 21, he talks about the authority of Christ. And, and notice how expansive this description is. I mean, it's an authority over every power. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Christ is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. There's nothing above him. His authority is over all eternity. Verse 21 says, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This is not a temporary kingship. This is an eternal kingship. And it's an authority over the church as well. Verse 22, he put all things under his feet, gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ is not just Lord of creation. He's Lord of the church. And, and, and I find myself wondering about this passage. You know, Paul gives this prayer, but why does he end with this long, uh, uh, just grand statement about the, the enthronement and the exaltation of Christ? And I think that part of the answer to that is that those were things that fueled Paul's prayers. How do they do that? Well, there's two things you need to, to, to recognize. Number one is that Scripture clearly says that Christ is the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords over all the earth. Now, that is an objective fact. And it doesn't matter whether you recognize it as a fact or not. There's many people in the world who don't recognize Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It doesn't matter. It's an objective reality that is true right in this moment. And the second reality is this. Now, don't, don't miss how significant this is. Scripture says not only that Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the authority over all authorities, but that if you are a believer, you have a direct line of access to the King of kings. Just let that sink in for a minute. This one who has authority over all authorities, over all powers, has dominion over all the earth, and who rules in all of eternity. We're not talking about a, a president here. We're not talking about a prime minister. We're talking about the king of eternity. And you, if you are a believer, have a direct line of access to that king. And if that doesn't give you fuel for your prayer life, I don't know what will. Because I think that's something that's going on here with Paul. It's spilling out of him. And he knows who Christ is, and he knows that he has access to Christ because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. And so, of course, he can't help but pray. Of course, he can't help but go to Christ at all times. This was fuel for his prayers, not only for the Ephesians, but in all things. And so, as we prepare to close today, let me ask you this. Where do you find yourself as we are still in the first month of 2021 in terms of your own prayer life. You know, maybe some people feel like they're just running on empty. And you just feel like you're not motivated and you're not energized to pray these days. Well, one thing that might help is to go back to some of these prayers, like Paul's prayer here, and see what it is that energized Paul to pray. Or maybe you feel like you just lack focus in your prayers. I know how it can be where you feel like you're always praying for the same things. The concerns are always the same concerns. You're not really sure, where do I go from here? And if that's the case, maybe you should allow Paul's prayer here and elsewhere to provide some renewed focus for you in your own prayer life. You know, one of the most helpful ways I have found to grow in prayer myself is to go back to the prayers of Scripture, whether it's prayers that Jesus prayed, prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed, prayers in the Old Testament, and use those as a model. Personalize those as a way in which you can refocus your own prayers as you come to the Lord. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. As we close today, we're going to make Paul's prayer our prayer and lift this prayer up for ourselves as a people of high view.
as we continue to follow the Lord together. Let's pray together. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Father of glory. And we pray this morning that you would give us the spirit of wisdom. We pray that you would reveal to us a deeper knowledge of who you are. We ask that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we may know what is the hope to which you have called us and what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of your power toward us who believe. We pray these things in the name of Christ who was raised from the dead by your great might, who is seated at your right hand on the throne of heaven who is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Amen.